We've been going through the book of Nehemiah. We went all the way through the book of Ezra. Then we started on Nehemiah. We're in Nehemiah chapter 6. Uh, that's how far we've gotten so far. Nehemiah is the story, and Ezra is the story of the Jews coming out of Babylonian captivity. They go into Babylonian captivity because they aren't obedient to God, so God sends them to Babylon. They're there for about 70 or so years, at which time then they get liberated uh, by the Persians who conquer Babylon uh, and then are allowed to come back home. So then over the course of about 65 years, give or take, they come out of Babylonian exile and come back. Nehemiah is the third group to come back. Uh, when Nehemiah comes back, he comes back, takes a look at the city, and goes, there's no wall. Uh, and we can't protect ourselves without a wall. And so Nehemiah then is the story of them rebuilding the wall so that they are safe. Last week, we discussed uh, an internal problem they were having with people who had money taking advantage of people who did not have money. If you're looking to get offended, that message is online. Feel free to look that up and listen to that. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. If you search Pastor Pat Edrington or if you go to Facebook, we share our messages every week. That's a great way to catch up on whatever message you have missed. This week, then, we're back to the rigmarole that we left when we left chapter 4. We have these guys who are showing back up again, Sanballat and Tobiah. Uh, they are frustrated and angry. We are going to deal again with enemies. We're going to deal again with people running their mouth. We're going to deal again with how do you handle people when they have opinions, when they want to say things and do things to hurt you. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we jump into it, I really want you to uh, catch a glimpse of what I hope you understand about your faith and what we desperately want you to get a hold of if you call yourself a disciple of Christ and if you're trying to grow and be like Jesus. There is an enemy in this world who wants to destroy you. Now, I'm not talking about your neighbor who yells at you because you don't mow your yard enough. I'm talking about a spiritual level enemy. And that dude is Satan. Now, I know when you say Satan, everybody has opinions and thoughts and all kinds of weird stuff comes up and you get one side of it. The only reference point you have for Satan is some stupid thing you saw in a movie. So you think about like some red dude running around with a pitchfork or you think about like, you know, we need a young priest and an old priest and all that stupidity. Not the same. Uh, that's really not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with fallen angel who has been defeated by the cross of Jesus Christ, who hates you and wants to destroy you and doesn't want you to stay the course. There is a real lesson to be learned from what we are going to look at today in this. When you choose to step out from the darkness of this world. When you discover there is a God who created you and has a purpose for you, you get on the enemy's radar, but you go to work to try to fix what the world has broke. Christ fixes you. Christ brings it back together. He restores you. The enemy doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to stay broken. And what we're going to see today is the things that, that Nehemiah's enemies do is the exact same things that the enemy of this world will do to you because the enemy is not creative. He does the same things over and over. So the good news is then, you know what he's going to do every time. You know your enemy. You know what's going to happen. My dad played football in high school, and if you know my dad and you've spent any time around him, he will tell you the story of when they played Iliopolis, and Iliopolis had a tailback, and when they would line up, they would always run a reverse. And so they practiced every, all week long to watch for the reverse. If you see the guards and the tackles pull and they go that way, that kid's coming out the backfield the other way. And, and they get in the game, and dad notices the guards pull, and the whole team goes that way, but dad said in my head, I remember practice and so I went the other way and then I went and here he came out of the backfield he just popped out Bloop, there he was right in front of me and I did the only thing I know to do my big old father said I grabbed the kid by his jersey and I just held his jersey and the kid just started running around him in circles just running around trying to get free and dad said then I just started yelling help 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 until the team could get over and get him and tackle him but dad was able to do that because he knew the enemy. 
He knew what the other team was going to do. They'd practiced it. They'd seen it. And so there's Christians. If you know Satan's trying to destroy you, if you know the enemy doesn't want you to finish the work that God has put in front of you to do, be it fixing your broken life, being getting free of addiction, being restored your marriage, whatever it is, or maybe your work is you've done those things and now God's calling you into ministry to go do something great, to be able to sacrifice what the world says is valuable and to put what God says is valuable in front of you. We need to be aware of what the enemy is going to try to do to stop us from doing that, right? We need to be aware of, like, how's this guy going to come at us so we can figure out what to do? You start reading then in Nehemiah 6, one says this, Now when Sambalat and Tobiah, again, great names for enemies, right? It sounds like a comic book. And Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. So... At this point, the walls are up. Walls are 40 foot high, about 9 foot wide. They've got the walls up. They've got no gates in place. At this point, then, all the enemies around them, suddenly the Jews are on their radar. Well, why? Because if they put the gates in, it changes uh, the whole dichotomy of the region. These Jewish people now can defend themselves. They can close the gates and stay behind the walls. They can't just get run over. So at that point, then, we got to deal with what's going on. It's the same thing in your life if you make the decision, hey, I don't like who I was, and I'm trying to be a new thing. I'm going to try to fix this and get this back how it's supposed to be. I'm going to start to submit my will to God's will. I'm going to allow Christ to dwell into me and make me into a new thing. Now you're on the enemy's radar. Now suddenly the enemies in your life are starting to go, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? And those enemies can be spiritual, but hey, we don't need to pull punches around here. You also are going to have physical people who are going to be enemies when you make a decision to be better. I don't know why that is, but you're going to have people in your life that are like, mm-hmm, I bet you got religion. Mm-hmm, I bet you're trying to do better. Mm-hmm, I remember what you were. Mm -hmm. Those morons. So those people exist too, and they're just working for the wrong dude. But you've got to be aware, right? So what happens? Well, here's what they do first. Sam Blatt and Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together at Hakim Purim. What a great name. In the plain of Ono. Can't make that up. They intended to do me harm. I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They sent to me four times in this way. And I answered them the same, in the same manner every time. So what's the first thing the enemy is going to do? Distract you. He just wants to distract you with stupid stuff that doesn't really matter. Right? I mean, it's hilarious when you read this that the place they want him to come to is the valley of oh no. Oh no. And that's a literal place. And then you get into the history outside of the Bible, you start reading this valley of oh no. We don't know where Hakapurim is. We're assuming it's some spot in the valley. Uh, at this point, all these years later, that's been lost in history. But it's there. Ono's there, and Ono is a place that's notoriously hard to defend that was very common for uh, governors and kings to be assassinated at. So the enemy's not even trying to hide what he's doing. I mean, like, these two dum-dums are like, hey, you know that place where we killed the other governors and kings? Let's bring Nehemiah down there. Well, what do we call it? We call it Oh No. I think we should maybe rename it. I think they're going to figure out if we call the place Oh No. No, we're going to call it Oh No. So Nehemiah's like, what's he do with the distraction? Well, he's like, I'm not coming. Why would I leave the wall? Why would I leave the thing I'm trying to do for God to come deal with you two bozos? I'm not coming down there, no. So what do they do? You really should come to the valley. No. You really should come down here, though. Four times, same message. Come to the valley. Four times, same thing. It's distraction. Now, you may sit there and go, well, I'm not. That would never work on me. I'm not like that. This garbage works on you all the time. This happens to you. Christian people fall into this trap all the time. You People will distract you with all kinds of garbage in your life. The enemy will distract you with all kinds of stuff. You know what one of the enemy's favorite things to do? The enemy wants to make you feel like before God can do the work in front of you, you've got to do a bunch of work on yourself. That's distraction. Christ isn't going to love you until you stop drinking. Christ isn't going to love you until you stop running around. Christ isn't going to love you until you stop listening to that rock and roll music. 
It's idiotic. But that's how our brains work. Like, you somehow think, you've got some weird image in your head that you think is like, this is what a Christian looks like. I've got to be like this person. I've got to be Johnny Christian. And if I don't look that way, then God won't let. So before I can wander before Calvary, before I can come before the cross and allow God to use me or God to shape me, I've got to get all of this stuff figured out. Well, that ain't from God. That's from the enemy. Because if the enemy can make it where all you're ever doing is self-help and self-worth and self-work and self-actualization and never actually submitting your will and allowing Christ to make you a new thing, then guess what? You don't ever fix anything. You just realize it needs fixed. Yep, I'm really broke. I'm really broke. Someday I'll get it figured out. Someday I'll fix this. Someday I'll do the thing I need to do. Someday I'll do... No, you won't. He doesn't want you to actually do the work. He wants you to get off the wall and go out and just talk to your enemy. Just go break bread with people who are trying to kill you. That's the, that's, and when you put it into that context, you go, why would anybody, that's so dumb, why would you do that? But we do it all the time. You ever think you know what the enemy will do? The enemy will make stuff up, will talk about you, will say things that aren't true to distract you that way. Where you get tied up like that, and they want you, so then you're just, oh, well, hmm, huh, I don't know, and I don't, hmm, and then you're just chasing rabbits off in left field, not doing what's put in front of you because you are worried about all the distraction. The best thing that you can do as Christians is this know what work you're doing. What do you mean by that, Pastor Pat? Well, what I mean is understand what Christ did. We try to preach it every week because if the only thing you get from vintage church is this, at least then you know the gospel. Here's how the gospel works. You're depraved. You're a sinner. You are not capable of being inherently righteous or good, period. You can't make yourself good. You can't buy being good. You can't read the right self-help book to be good. You can't go out and get a list of good things to do that will make you good. At the very core of who you are, you are condemned to death because you were born into sin. When God the Father looks at you because He is just and His character is the same yesterday and forever, there is consequence for the bad things you have done. That consequence is death. Period. Well, but Pastor Pat, I try to be good. Well, we all do, but we're not. So if that offends you, get over it. I'm talking to myself too. I'm not standing up and telling you I'm righteous. You're not. We're all sinners, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's literally in the Bible. So what's the gospel then? What's the good? That's not good news. I don't feel good about myself right now, Pastor Pat. I'm not feeling like you're helping me because all you're telling me is that I'm a messed up mess, and there's nothing I can do but be a messed up mess. Correct. Recognize that. Own that. Put that in your life. Let that resonate in who you are. You will never fix yourself, which means you're never better than anybody, which means you can't lord it over anybody. You got it figured out, which means that you don't know the right way to do. What's that going to do? That's going to drive you to go find answers somewhere else. And I can tell you that that answer is found in the cross of Jesus Christ and in his death and in his resurrection. There is a reason why 2,000 years later, people still get together every Sunday morning to celebrate and worship the God who lived. Christ died and Christ resurrected from the dead. He paid the sacrifice and fulfilled the Old Testament law so that you can live, so that you can go before Christ and go, Hello, hi, it's me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a mess. And he goes, yes, you all are. I am not. And you go, I'm talking to you. I believe you're alive. I believe you can talk back to me. This isn't just some weird religion. This isn't some code I'm putting on to show people how pious and good I am. I believe you're a living, breathing God, and you have a plan for my life. So I'm recognizing I don't know how to fix this. I'm just going to submit this thing to you. And if I submit this thing to you, then you can do your work upon me. And Christ goes, yes, that's the gospel. Jesus goes, I'll take your hot, broken mess, and I'm going to make it into a new thing. Well, how's he make it into a new thing? Because here's where we got to be clear with the gospel. Here's what I want you to get so you're a true disciple of Jesus. When he makes it a new thing, that's not anything you did. That wasn't because you went to church on a Sunday and sat in a pew and were like, I'm reading my Bible 30 minutes a day and praying. 
that's going to make me so that Jesus lives in me. No! Jesus lives in you because He has to live in you so that you can live. He did that while you were broken. You read your Bible, you pray, you commit to Him, you follow Him, you submit your will to Him because you love Him and you want to know more about Him. You don't do those things so He will love you. You love Him and do those things. That's called propitiation, which is a giant word nobody uses in our world anymore. But propitiation means to stand in place of. So when God looks at you, think of it like this. If you go out tomorrow and that neighbor who's mad at you that you don't mow your grass right, if you make a Molotov cocktail, that's where you buy really cheap alcohol, put a Kleenex in the top, light it on fire. Stay with me. If you make that and you throw that at his house and you burn his house down, you'll feel better. You will. I'm not going to lie to you. That's going to feel good in the moment. But you're going to have to stand accountable for what you just did. The cops are going to show up and go, did you burn your neighbor's house down? And you're going to go, yeah, he's real annoying. He's always yelling at me that I don't mow my yard right. So I set his house on fire. We can't just set people's houses on fire. We're a civilized nation. Oh, so what's going to happen? We are going to go to jail. Hmm. Consequences. What Jesus does is shows up and goes, I'll go to jail for him. Well, why would you do that? Because I love you, and I know you weren't thinking, and I know that if I t pay the price for what you did, then I can redeem you and make you what you're supposed to be, which is not the psycho that burns his neighbor's house down, but it's the psycho that will live and die for his neighbor. So I'm going to radically change who you are by radically doing something in your life you don't deserve. And then the only way you won't ever stand accountable for that thing is if you allow Christ to do that for you. Man, the minute you go, I don't need Jesus no more, the judge shows back and goes, and you're going to jail, dumb dumb. Because you burnt your neighbor's house down. The only reason we didn't send you to jail is because Christ is advocating for you. Well, now he's not advocating for because you rejected him, so now you're going to jail. Because you're still who you were. Huh. That's the gospel. That's why it's good news. And that's the work he's doing on you. So what that means then is all this stuff in your life that's a mess, all these broken relationships, all these things that you're like, I don't know how I'm going to fix this, or I don't know how I'm going to fix that, all the way to your understanding of death, all the way to like, I got health issues and I'm scared because what if I die? All of that is radicalized by Jesus. It completely changes the way you see who you are. And if you're vacillating in that, if you're somewhere in the between, like maybe that's true, or I'm still worried, or I still have fear, I don't know how this is going to happen, that's the work you're doing. It's not that Christ isn't doing it. It's not that you have to do something to make it happen. It's that you haven't fully realized what God has for you. And when you do realize that, it's like putting gates up in the wall, and then the enemy can't get in. Well, the enemy doesn't want you to get in, so the first thing he's going to do is try to distract you from doing the work. So before we go further, you need to understand, you got to know you're doing the work. That's why Nehemiah says to them, I'm, what do you think I'm going to get off this wall? You're the enemy. You're trying to kill me. I ain't coming down off the wall. I'm on the wall. Well, but what about this or what about that? Or don't you think you should get some counseling? Or don't you think you should go? Maybe if it falls in line with the work, but if it's just distraction, I ain't doing it. And as Christians, we're not going to be dumb. We're going to be smart and recognize what falls in line with doing work and what's just the enemy distracting us. And when that doesn't work, he'll go to something else. The minute he realizes, ah, I can't distract him, we're on to a bigger and better thing. Here's where it goes next. Well, in the same way, Sam Blatt, for the fifth time, <laughs> just keeps sending people to him. You know Nehemiah had to be like, oh, here they come again sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That's why you're building the wall. According to these reports, you wish to become their king. You have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judea. And now the king will hear of these reports, so now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such thing as you have said has been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. They wanted to frighten us and think their hands will drop from their work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. 
if he can't distract you, he's going to discredit you. If he can't get your attention off what you're going to do, then he wants to make it that nobody's going to listen to you when you go to talk about what it is that you're doing. This whole thing's interesting in the context of ancient Near East. You didn't send open letters. You wrote your letter on a scroll, papyrus, whatever, rolled it up, piece of wax with your seal, sealed it up, and sent that to whoever it was for. And then when they got it, if it was sealed, you knew it hadn't been tampered with. In Persia, Rome, all the major, they had punishments for the messenger if that seal was broken. So the only reason to send an open letter was if you wanted to what? Gossip. You wanted people to read what was in the letter. And all the stuff in this letter is insane. We know that, that you declared yourself the king. Well, who told you that? Sanballat did. No, no, don't say it's me. Someone else. Geshem told us that you think you're the new king and you wanna, you're building the walls because you're going to try to overthrow the per art of Xerxes. That's what's going on. So then that's just coming in across the land and every dingleberry that's holding the thing's reading it. Oh, well, Nehemiah's declaring himself the king. I read it right here. Has to be true. I read it in a letter. And you go, nobody would be that stupid. Oh, well, you've obviously never been on Facebook. That's what the enemy wants to do. I did youth ministry for a lot of years. If you didn't know that, now you do. Our youth ministry was 80% unchurched. It was 300 kids on a Wednesday night. It was pure chaos in the best possible way. This message I'm preaching to you right now, I would have preached to them. We talked hard and we preached Jesus, what we did. I've done that my whole ministry career. I will do it my whole ministry career. If you don't preach Jesus, you don't preach the gospel, I'm not really sure why you're holding a microphone. We had people in this city who would say the most crazy things about our youth program because we had kids at it. Well, the only reason that you, uh, the kids come to your youth group is because you don't preach anything about Jesus. Well, I've never seen your dumb head there, so I'm not really sure what you're talking about. We had people who were a part of the church that wouldn't let their kids come to the youth group because there was kids in the youth group who didn't act like Christian kids. To the place that I had people who would meet me and go, can you do two youth ministries? Will you do a youth ministry for the Christian kids and a youth ministry for the other ones? Can you imagine church on Sunday like that? 9 o'clock is our Christian service. 11 o'clock is our heathen. <laughs> Pastor Pat won't be at the 9 o'clock service. He doesn't like you. He will be with the heathen. Like, you just would go, I don't even understand what it is that you're talking about. Listen, always be leery anytime somebody wants to run down a ministry that is successful. Well, Pastor Pat, now you've told us before we got to be able to discern what's going on, and that might be my spiritual gift. My spiritual gift is discernment. Not a spiritual gift. Nowhere in the Bible. I know Christians love to tell people that. God's given me the spiritual gift of discernment. We well, only gave it to you, and he didn't put it in the Bible when he listed the spiritual gifts. I'm not saying things aren't corrupt. I'm not saying that sometimes stuff gets shady. I'm not saying that unsafe pe or that Christian people will sometimes do things that don't glorify God. Because, hello, we talked about it earlier. We're all deprived and falling short of the glory. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that when you see people come before the Lord, Christians should be excited they're doing that. It shouldn't be your job to try to discredit what they're doing because your thing isn't going the way their thing's going. The same is true on a ministry level all the way down to a personal level. I've seen people post stuff on Facebook about other people that I'm like, you know they can read your status. And just because you didn't put their name in it, it's called sneak dissing for all the oldies in the room, if you didn't put their name doesn't mean they don't know you're talking about them. You can act like you got Jesus all you want, but I know who you were last Saturday night. Pfft, he knows who you are right now, you gossiping pert. What are you doing? 
How are you going to have somebody decide, I'm going to do a work? Somebody to say, I'm not going to be this thing I was. I'm going to be a new thing. I'm going to go about becoming what God wants me to be. I'm going to put to death who I was. I'm going to stand up in the face of adversity. I'm going to go with this to war with this enemy who's trying to kill me. And instead of you being the hands and feet of Christ and standing in that person's life and helping them fight the battles they're fighting, you feel it's your job to stand on the other team, on the other side, to line up with Satan and run that person into the ground to where they don't want to be a part of your church. What are you doing? You know a question I get all the time about vintage? What do I have to wear? What? Clothes. Please wear pants and a shirt. After that, I don't care. Well, Pastor Pat, all I have is a shirt with beer on it. Okay, good. Wear a beer shirt. I don't care. Like, do you think that Jesus can't save you in your beer shirt? And if you're in here and you're a Christian person, you're like, I don't like that. I don't. What if they start wearing beer shirts on Sunday? Then you both can come to the altar. Because you don't get it. Like, isn't it, shouldn't it strike you as weird that in the American church, one of the number one questions people ask when about attending your church is what should I wear? Not what do you believe, not why do you believe someone came back from the dead, not what is the gospel, not why do you believe the Bible is infallible, not why do you follow this religion, not what is the thing that you're going after, not why you've devoted your life to this. The number one question that comes up, top five anyway, is what kind kind of pants do I wear into the room? Because I don't want my pants to offend anybody. And then Christian people will go get in their car and go, did you see your pants? Did you see them this morning? Can you believe somebody would wear those pants to church? Did she not have a mother? Like, guys, our job is to rescue people who are drowning in death and despair. We j just laid out the gospel. We just said what it is we're doing. You're talking about a whole army of people that are going to carry all sorts of trauma and brokenness into your churches and bring it down to an altar. And you believe that there is a cross that is bigger than any mess they have. Do you really want to stand around and critique the way people who are standing in the middle of the PTSD of their life critique the way they look or the way that they talk or the way that they... What are you doing? And do you not recognize that if you're a baby Christian, how Christians behave then become a representation not only of themselves, but of the God they are presenting. So if you are judgmental, if you seek to discredit, if you are a gossip and a backbiter, you are not only doing that to your own reputation, you're doing that to the representation of Jesus. Because unbelievers look at you and you are supposed to be his hands and feet and those hands and feet are vipers. And so unbelievers don't want to be around you. And they not only that, they don't believe that what you are presenting, that the redemptive power of the cross is true because they look at your broken life and you're just as bad as they ever thought of being, but you're acting pious and pretending you're not. Which is why Unchristians say what? I don't like Christians because they're hypocrites. They want to pretend like they got it all figured out, and I know they're doing the same things on the weekend I'm doing. They're just not posting it on Facebook. I know you're a train wreck. I at least own it. Like I've heard people say that, and they're not wrong. So anytime you run into this and you look at it and you see this going on, if it's discreditation, if it's people trying to want to hurt people, if it's people trying to run someone down, that isn't of Jesus. You should be building people up. Period. Now you build people up in a lot of different ways. That doesn't mean either you don't just ever talk about someone's garbage. Well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. No, nah, hurt their feelings. Hurt them. Hurt them. Like if your kid's doing something stupid, you don't hurt their feelings. Like if your two-year-old's got a knife and he's trying to put it in the electrical outlet, you're telling me you're not going to like tackle your kid so he doesn't shock himself stupid? No, you are. And nobody's going to look at your situation and go, what a bad dad. 
You should have gently talked to him. Calm down, buddy. Now, now before we put the... <clears throat> oh, too late. When I was, when at least we were kind. Jesus wasn't kind in his confrontation. He told Malta, just go and sin no more. You're a sinner. Stop it. But there's a difference between that and then just trying to destroy somebody behind their back without actually caring about what they're walking through. So build people up. Someone fails in your life and falls short, it's not your job to post it on Facebook or call 15 people and tell them how bad they're doing. It's your job to go, hey, get back in the fight. You took one on the chin. You're still alive. You're still kicking. They didn't knock you out. You got a strong chin. Next time, don't put your chin in that situation. But let's get back in the fight. Let's not give up. I'll go with you. I'll be alongside of you. And guess what? I ain't telling anybody about this. No one else needs to know. I'll be your brother. I'll be your sister. We know what mess you're walking through. I'll pray for you, and I'll bear that burden with you. We don't need to air all your laundry out for everyone else. Well, if that doesn't work, then what? Well, we'll just deceive you internally. Right? If we can't get it that way, uh, then what we'll do is we will just have people come into the inside. Where am I at my... Here it is. So we will just come in internally and try to deconstruct it. We'll try to get people to say the things you want to hear. Verse 10 picks up. Now, when I went into the house of Shema, the son of Deleah, son of Methotelham, <laughs> write that one down, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I won't go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced a prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambala had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in a way and sin, so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember, Tobiah and Sambalot, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess, Nadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So what happens here? Well, we try to discredit, we try to, we try to distract. None of that works, so now we're just going to straight up deceive you. So if the enemy cannot come into your life and distract you, or if he can't discredit you to the place you don't want to continue about the work, well, then we're just going to deceive you about the work. Well, what's that look like? Welcome to watered-down Christianity where we don't actually confront you about any sin. We just validate you in your struggle and let you sit in your own dirt. Welcome to modern Christianity where we can't talk about sexuality, we can't talk about choices, we can't talk about God's calling of holiness, we can't talk about righteous living, we can't talk about any of those things because <laughs> you might bother the snowflakes. We don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. We don't want to, Pastor Pat, you got to be real careful now. Right? Some of you in this room, if you're not combative like me, if you don't have this personality, you may start to feel it creep up the back of your neck, right? That's what my wife always says. She's like, when you sometimes when you talk, I just get scared to death. My brother used to do stuff with me on stage, and he's like, I hate being on stage with you. It freaks me out. I never know what you're going to do. And you don't care. You're, you're like a wild maniac. You'll just say things and disappear, and then it's like, hmm, whatever. You'll go eat pizza and have a good old day. And I'm just like, ah, people don't know what we said. Listen, the Bible teaches us how to live and how to act. You can't just find things that you want to find and then just assume that if they say the thing that you like, that's what you're going to adhere to. There are definitions about what it is it means to be a follower of Christ. Listen, if you really believe that you're a broken sinner and you've fallen short of the glory of God, and the only way that you can achieve the glory of God, the only thing that you can become truly Christ-like is to submit everything to Christ and allow him to live within you, then you would think you would have a desire to know what that submission entails and looks like. And you wouldn't think that you would just listen to what any crazy person tells you on the internet 
over what centuries of biblical study and the Bible itself says. And yet, we live in a world that when you talk about the enemy will deceive you, that is the modern church. There is this weird idea that the most important thing is to put butts in seats, and the only way to put butts in the seat is to make yourself the most appealing as possible. And if you don't make yourself appealing, people won't come. To make yourself appealing, you need to be culturally relevant. And to be culturally relevant means you can't actually talk about anything in culture that goes against what you actually believe, because if you do, you may run people off. Well, let me tell you something this morning. I could give a rip about culture. In fact, the Bible says you're to be in the world, but not of it. You're going to be a culture within a culture. And they're going to hate you for it. You're going to make enemies. You're going to have people that don't like it. You want to tick people off? Just say that sexuality is a choice. You have proclivity. You can have things you're attracted to. You choose how to respond. <laughs> you can't tell me that. You don't understand what it's like to go through. I do. I'm a human being. I have desires and thoughts and processes. I have things I think where I go, hmm, that's way out in left field. That's not who God wants me to be. I better submit that. It's just like when you want to throw a Molotov cocktail at your neighbor's house. You don't do that. Well, why not? You thought it. I think that's different, but I don't know how. Listen, you're either in or out on this idea we've presented in the world we're in that you don't make choices about anything. You either just respond to the nature inside of you and you're just an automaton, you're just a robot and you have no control over it, or you are the Imago Dei, created in the image of God with the ability to reason and think and you're responsible for the choices you make. Our culture exists somewhere in a gray area where we have agreed with some of that and denied others. Christianity firmly exists in a black and white world where you stand accountable for the things that you do. And so to wander off and to find people that will tell you the things that you want to hear inside of a religion and make a new religion, all you are doing is undermining the real religion and possibly removing yourself from the redemption of the cross of Jesus. Paul writes this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is judged to the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul wrote that to Timothy as Timothy tried to preach to a culture that feels like is our world. Christians can't be dumb. But in this world, we celebrate stupid. And that, that bothers you. I don't mean to offend you. I'm not calling you stupid. I'm just challenging you to think about the thing that you think is true. Why do you think it? Where did you read that? How do you know that thing is, like, you can't just say, I saw it on Facebook, so it has to be true. You can't discount 2,000 years of church history. How arrogant are you to look at 2,000 years of church history and then go, uh, they were wrong. Councils after council, multiple meeting after multiple meeting, count, multiple times where there was restorations and reformations back to get make sure that what we're teaching and what we're saying is directly in line with who Jesus is. And then you're going to show up in 2022 and be like, actually... I was searching YouTube for someone who had my opinion, and I found it. They are right, and all of you are wrong. That's not how this works. We don't treat other things like that. I don't understand why we treat understanding who Christ is that way. When I go to the doctor, and I piddle my big rear end in there, and I sit down in front of my doctor about all my blood pressure medicine, and he goes, Patrick, you are fat. And your weight is detrimental to your blood pressure. If you were to lose weight and not be dormant and sit on your rear end every day, and you were to get up and walk around, it would improve your blood pressure. 
you need to lose 80 pounds or you're going to die younger. I don't hear that and go, that's your opinion. That's what you think. That's fat shaming. You can't fat shame me. I'm made this way. This is who I am. Why are you always judging me? Why are you mistreating? Like, I can do all of that. I can even get a club. I can go out and, and pull the sign up looking for fat people. And we can all get together as fat people, and we can declare, I no longer find fat people unattractive, and I love all fat people. And if you're fat, we can be fat together. Fat, fat, fat. Fat is right. You can't tell me not to be fat because this is how I am. I'm fat. And you know what? I probably still will die at 68. You know why? Because being fat's not healthy. It's just a fact. I didn't write the rules. That's just what they are. And I don't understand... Like, two things can be true. It can hurt my feelings and be offensive if somebody tells me, you need to take better care of yourself, because now I'm face-to-face -face with my own mortality. i got to work through it. There's probably a better way for him to say that than to say it the way he did it. And it also can be true, the thing that he's saying. The same is true in faith. Christ is calling you to submit your will. All of your choices have to come under his submission. Anybody who tells you that you can both have your choices and God's will is lying to you. That is deception. That is deceiving. You can't serve two different things. Nehemiah knows that. That's why he responds that way. How does Nehemiah respond in this text? It's one of my favorites when he gets to it because he just says what? He just prays and says, eh, condemn these people. I'm staying on the wall. Hey, God, just wanted to let you know, this guy that I just was listening to was saying that we can both be a sinner and you can still love us. He wants me to be both. Here's his name. Put that in your books. I'm going to go about my work, my business, doing the thing you've called me to do. I don't need to be distracted by this thing. I don't need to be led astray. I don't need to be deceived because I know who I am. I know what I believe. I have my foundation of faith. I'm a disciple of you, and I've not wandered off into the darkness of this. And even though this thing is appealing to me because there's no challenge in it for me to change, I know that's not of you because you did not create me to dwell in my brokenness. You created me to be a child of the king, bought with a price, and you're going to pick me up and make me into what you want me to be. So I'm not going to be content just staying the way I was. Anybody that wants to preach a religion or tell you that God loves you just as you are doesn't understand who Christ is or what he has for you. Why would Jesus come and die and resurrect so that you could be set free from sin if his intention was not to take you from brokenness and make you restored to back what he wants you to be? What kind of evil God would do that? What kind of God would say, I'm going to die and resurrect so you can stay broken? Well, why are you dying? That didn't make any sense. Why would you do that? He didn't do that. What he did was died and resurrected so that you can be free from the darkness in this world. But that darkness doesn't want to let go of you. It doesn't want to take its hands off you. It wants to put its tendrils in your life and remind you of what you were and what you did. It wants to distract you with all kinds of pretty pictures and desires and things you think you need. When the truth of the matter is you need to look at all those things and say, baby, I'm staying on the wall. I ain't getting off the wall till the wall's done. God put me on the wall, and until the wall's finished, I ain't leaving. And this wall ain't easy. I don't like it. We're building a wall. It's 40 foot tall. I got little girls out here and women out here. These people can't pick up rock. But we're doing the thing God wants me to do, and I'm going to keep doing it until that thing's done, and to hell with all of the rest of you. That's not where you are or who you are. I ain't listening to you because you are not a child of the king, and you are not the son of God. You are not the son of man. You don't sit at the right hand of the Father. You don't define me. Christ does. So shut your mouth, get out of my life, and I'm going to stay on the wall. Because when you do that, you get to finish Nehemiah 6 like this. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. Let's adopt that. Let's make September Elul. They did it in 52 days. Every historical account that you read, this is a sticking point in the world. They'll go, there's no way a bunch of nobody novice wall builders completed the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. And it's hilarious to read about and watch because uh, unbelievers have to reconcile the fact that chunks of this wall are still over there. So they're like, well, somebody did it. 
And we know that the wall wasn't there uh, at certain points, and then we know the wall shows up in history at certain points. And so it has to be in this short window that even if you take it out of the 52-day context, it's still in such a short window they don't know how it happened. 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and felt greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shekinah, the son of Era. And his son, Johananan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Barakah, as his wife. Although so they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. So Tobiah continues to be an enemy, never gets it figured out, even to the place that they are, they've lost their esteem and they don't know what to do because the walls are completed. They're still sending letters to Nehemiah. I don't like you. Mm. But did you catch the enemy's response when the work is realized? It's a decrease in esteem. It's a decrease in pride. It's a bunch of people eating crow. If you have enemies, if you have people that are running you down, I tell people this all the time. Pastor Pat, I'm really trying to get my garbage together, but these people in my life, man, they're so mean, and they're, all, they're always making fun of me, and they're always trying to get me to sin. They're always trying to make me do things, I, and I don't know what to do. Stay on the wall. Stay on the wall. They're doing those things to you because that's what you were. It's not who you are. And if you want to conquer that, and if you want to defeat that attitude in them, then you need to prove to them that what you're saying is true, and the only way to do that is for you to stay on the wall, to do the work, to keep raging against the thing that they're trying to get you to do. You need to know who you are and what it is God is accomplishing in your life, and then you need to make the decision that from this day forward, that's who I'm going to be. And any bozo that wants to show up with an opinion can take their opinion and their happy selves and go fly a kite. I don't care what you think. Now, what's beautiful about that is it's not just humans. You can take that all the way up to the granddaddy of evil Satan himself. I mean, don't you want to reduce Satan in your life to the place that the last thing that he has to do is just send you letters? Can you imagine that if you would get so steeped in who God is and has for you that you could complete so much work and you could be so about the Father's business that you would get to the place that the enemy has just reduced you to snail mail? He's just sending you form letters at this point. I don't know. Send him the form letter. He's doing whatever he wants anyway. She's out there. I can't. I, I've, lo I've, I've lost this mess. I don't even know what to do. Just remind her that she's still a sinner. And then you get it in their mail and you're like, yes, I am. But Christ is propitiating. He stands in the gap for me. I am a sinner, but he's bigger than the sin. And the enemy's like, I know, I know, I know. Do you understand that there is liberation as you complete the works God puts in your life? That what starts is such a terrible, hard moment because you haven't ever done it ends in a different way. When I was a kid, uh, our high school had a swimming pool. And Chris and I were obnoxious children. We were, I can say it, and my children are obnoxious. There's just some, like when you get around spirited kids. That's what my grandma used to call us. Those boys are spirited. Or like when you people will say to my wife every now and then, I bet you just never stop laughing. You don't get it. You don't understand. Like, it's funny for 40 minutes on Sunday morning. It's not funny when this is your life and this doesn't shut off. And there's times that your wife's like, please go away. Just go somewhere entertain the wall, or Amy will go, what are we doing, and you, I don't need three jokes, so just tell me, okay, give me the jokes, okay, great, and then, so because of that personality issue, my mother would try to find things to do to get rid of us, so you could go to the swimming pool 
at the high school and take swim lessons. You could take swim lessons in the morning. If you pass the test, you could get into advanced classes in the afternoon. So you could do swim lessons at 9 a.m. You could have a swim lesson at 1 in the afternoon, and then free swim was 3 to 6. And if you had a 9 a.m. and you had the 1, you could swim, and then you could stay and eat at the school and then swim in the afternoon. We never came home in the summer. I was a certified lifeguard by 11. When I was six was the first time I went off the diving board. And I can remember, uh, to this day, being terrified, standing on the edge of the board with my knees shaking, looking at the water at Miss Mabs, with her going, come on, Pat, jump and I'll catch you. And me being like, I am an 80-pound first grader. If I jump off of this thing, you will die, and I will die. And having to conquer that fear and trust in my head that she would catch me is the best analogy that I can give for you to stay the course and do the work. Because here's what will happen, just like with that diving board. The first time that you come out of darkness and you got to trust Christ, it ain't easy. You're going to have that moment where the only thing I've ever trusted in my whole life is myself. So, Christ, you can stand here and tell me I'm a child of the king and you got a plan and you're going to save me, and you, but I still have to make the decision to jump to you and I'm not so sure you're going to catch me because the, there's no ground underneath you, Miss Mabs. When I hit the water, we're all going to go under. What am I going to do? We're going to drown. We're going to die. And you still got Miss Mabs going, just jump in the water. Jesus is the same way. Just come to me with your heavy burden and I'll give you rest. I know you're telling me that, but this isn't easy. But you'll trust him, and you'll do it that first time, and it gets easier and easier. By the time I was 16 years old, I was not allowed to jump off the diving board anymore because my buddies and I would jump off the diving board and would springboard each other, get two people on the board, safety first, and shoot people into the rafters in the pool area so that you were 15 feet above the pool water, hanging off the rafters, and then we would monkey bar across the pool and drop into the pool at various places, trying to land on top of girls. Because flirting, that's a radical departure from six and afraid to jump in for someone to catch me, to now we're monkey barring across the top of the thing to fall onto people. But when you can swim, and when you know it can catch you, and when you trust the situation, the way you respond is radically different. Trust me when I tell you, if you trust Christ, He's going to catch you. And the more He catches you, the more you want to start testing it. That's how you end up starting a church with no money, no staff, no job, no idea where you're going to meet, no idea how it's going to happen, and in six years you end up with this. Because you go, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know what we're going to meet. I don't know who's going to do music. I don't know how we're going to do But I know God has put into my heart a desire to preach and teach. I know that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know there are people who are lost in darkness, that there is hope for them. And so I'm going to keep jumping in the pool, even though I don't even know if there's water in it at this point, because I know Christ has me. And if Christ has me, He has you. So I'm going to be faithful and do the work He called me to do so that you can be faithful and do the work He's called you to do so that we can look at enemies of this world and go, I can't hear you, so that we get on the mailing list of Satan because he doesn't know how to deal with a bunch of people who are in the world but not of it. Let's go be that church. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning, and I thank you for the work you are going to do here. Lord, we stand on the precipice of greatness. We'll keep jumping into the pool. We'll keep doing the things that you've called us to do. Lord, we are in a season of prayer and in a season of seeking you to find direction. Lord, for the people in this room that are still on the diving board, Lord, I pray you would just call to them in darkness. Teach us to trust. Lord, teach us to rely on you 
redefine who those people are. Wayward sons and wayward daughters, God calls to you in the darkness. You are not garbage. You are not trash. You are bought with a price, and there is freedom from the sin that is controlling you at the cross of Jesus Christ. All life is a choice. The greatest choice you will ever make is to carry yourself down and put yourself in front of Calvary and allow allow Christ to redefine who you are. And so this morning I pray that over this room, freedom from sin, freedom from darkness, freedom from definitions that the world says we can't get free from. For the rest of us in this room, Lord, who exist on the vine, for the rest of us that are looking for where to go and what to do, Lord, I pray you would give us direction. You would give us guidance. You would be alongside us. You would continue to inspire us and push us to jump into the pool. Lord, send to us people to do ministry. Send us people who can minister. Raise up leaders in your church. Lord, let us look back in 10 years and see the greatness that was accomplished because we were faithful to stay on the wall. Lord, we pray that you would honor and bless the work that we are about to do in this city. Use us, Lord, to be your hands and feet. Let us always be mindful to not be distracted or to be deceived, Lord, or to be led astray from what it is you have for us. Lord, help us not to listen when they discredit who we are. Lord, it's your will and your power and your authority. We pray you that over each and every person in this room. We pray that over our church that you would bless and honor who we are. We thank you, Lord, for what it is you're going to accomplish. We thank you for the freedom found at Calvary. Now, Lord, I pray you would help us to go and be that church. It's in your name we pray. Amen.